Welcome everyone and happy new year. You are listening to Sanctuaries Coffee and Conversation. My name is Myrna Haskell. I'm executive editor of Sanctuary Magazine. This is an online publication for women that empowers and inspires. Our focus is on women in the arts, women humanitarians, philanthropists, and business leaders who make a difference in their local or global, global communities, health and wellness, inspirational travel, career journeys, and finance. You can find us at sanctuary-magazine.com. This morning, my guest is Penny Brantley. She is an acclaimed oil painter whose works have been exhibited throughout the United States. She has been invited as a guest for many podcasts and television shows, and she has been featured in numerous magazines, including Sanctuary last year in our March 2020 issue. She was our featured artist. So I'm so excited to have you this morning. Welcome, Penny. Thank you, Myrna. I'm really honored. You've been so kind to me with the previous interview that I did with you, and you're just you're doing a great job. You do so much for so many people. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. It's an oh my honor goodness. For me. Oh, Penny, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You know, I'm a huge fan of your work. I've seen one of your pieces in person at a recent exhibition, so that was wonderful. But this morning, we're here to talk about a new series of yours, and that's the Gestapo prison paintings. And so I wanted to start off with asking you about just the series in general. What was the inspiration behind the series? I know you're a lover, lover of travel, so if you want to talk about that a little bit, that's mm -hmm. fine too. But I just would just like you to talk about the series in general at first. Okay. Well, first, I'd like to give some background information on why I, I became so interested in World War II, because that's what the Gestapo prison paintings are from. Um, my late dad was in the, was in the war in, in Europe, and he was affected by those experiences his entire life. So that's why it's really close to my heart. I'll probably, as, as my husband said, you're going to start crying, aren't you? I mean, me, uh, because it's very emotional for me. Um, my husband, Bob, and I are both very, were very ardent travelers before we met. So we, of course, after we were together, it's been great. We've been to so many places, but we particularly, not that we only do that, but while we're traveling, we go to places that were related to World War II. We've been to a lot of places where my dad himself was, which is very, very meaningful and emotional for me. And um, we, we've been, uh, well, actually, at my mother's suggestion about 16 years ago, Bob and I found my dad's closest Belgian friends uh, from World War II. They, my dad and his squadron lived in a chateau that was in this town where these people were that he became good friends with. So my mom suggested we look for them because my dad died in 89, but um, and all this time later, she said, you know, we're, we were going to that area. Why, why not try to find them? Well, I did find them. And um, on our first trip there, uh, to look at my notes, um, they picked us up at the train station. We had been in Amsterdam and we, we went to their little town. They picked us up at the train station. And uh, Denise, the woman, told us about um, what happened to her family. Her dad was the, uh, was the, um, the captain of the gendarmerie, which was like the police chief in their community. So the Nazis were of course afraid of him because he had power. So she told us about the Nazis breaking into their home in the middle of the night. And at her, her exact words, they, he was, her, she saw her dad beaten bloody, put in chains and led away like a beast while she and her mother were screaming. Um, oh. And that's the last time she saw her father. So they only learned after the war that he was interned in three different concentration camps, starting one and uh, starting with one near Brussels called Brindonk, which they a few years later took us to see, which is a very moving experience. So he was first there, then he was transferred to one in Holland and ultimately to one in Germany where he died. And for instance, at that at Brindonk, the concentration camp that they took us to in Belgium, they have uh, some urns with dirt from the camp where he died and she said you know we don't know for sure of course but maybe you know some fragments of his bones or you know what were ground in ended up being bones or in that so that was very emotional for us but um the first our first trip there 
they took us to see to visit the chateau that daddy stayed in with his squadron when in their little town so we were driving up this long driveway past a huge pond with swans in it and then i looked over and and we could see the the chateau as we were approaching and at the time people were rolling out a red carpet so i said to our friends i said oh is there a special event here today and they said it's for you <laughs> Oh, I had to get out the Kleenex. Oh like I, my goodness, Penny. Uh, because, um, and, and the, the owner of the chateau and his wife were there. The mayor and his wife were there and a photographer from the newspaper. And the, the red carpet was for us, of course, in my dad's honor. So that oh, was a really amazing. Special. That's so special. And, and both the, the, the mayor and the, um, the owner of the chateau now, had both wanted you know me to bring them some photographs because I'd sent some to our friends before that of Daddy at the chateau and his friends at the chateau during the war. So I brought I had copies made and brought them to them. It turned out it's funny because one of the the photos of my dad at the chateau coming out of that front door where we were now approaching on a red carpet, uh, he was wearing these army issued. He was in the Army Air Corps, and he was wearing these army issued leather pants. My dad was wearing leather pants, <laughs> and it turned out that, so. I had a picture of that made for you know for these people, besides other things. But it turns out that now the owner of the chateau has an international leather clothing business there. <laughs> so I had a, after I learned that I had an enlargement made of the picture of Daddy in the leather pants. So it's on in the wall in the chateau now. Oh, uh, wow. So well I can see how these these paintings are then so close to your heart and so emotional yeah. for you personally. Yes. Uh, I think yes. I do feel that they drive emotion in the viewer as well for absolute sure. I um, hope so. Are you doing 12 all together in this series? That's um, what I'm planning on and I'll talk about a little about explaining some of the a few of the others I, you know not all 12 but what I have have in mind that from the photographs that I took there at the prison camp um, I, just some of them hit me so much that that I knew I had to do those um, uh, by the way that we were at the chateau that day on the first time that we went there and we've been there every year we go every year to see them they became family to us and we go, we don't spend our whole vacation there, but but we do go to see them. No, but she that's so nice. I love years that. Ago. But they brought out champagne at the at the chateau, and then they took us all to the um to the um city hall so that we could be officially received by the mayor under portraits of the king and queen of Belgium. And we had champagne again, and then we all went to lunch and had champagne again. So it was it was a wild day. And and his uh their a, a brother uh who lives in um uh, Ghent, I think it is, uh no Antwerp, where Rembrandt's from, and his wife both knew my dad too and they came to meet us there so it was just a very wonderful thing and then it turned out I just thought we'd see them once and that'd be it but instead we've seen them every year so this is why this has become so important to me that we were already looking up places going to them where where my dad had been but then we've also been to a number of places um that were important in World War One, both in France and Belgium so okay. this has been an important Import, very important and wonderful thing, a privilege for us because I feel like I'm doing it in honor of my dad and in honor of other people too. And it's it's like a treasure that my dad left for me, I think, uh, because it, it meant so much to him and it was a very emotional. And now you have this new relationship with these people. This is, it's oh. really... There's families. Yeah. Let's start with the first painting. I, I would like you to talk a bit about echoes of their voices, why you chose this one as the first image to paint. And then maybe you want to just talk a little bit more about the paintings that are, that go from there and you know what you're planning to do mm -hmm. by the end of the series. So if you could do that for us, okay. maybe just talk a little bit about the inspiration be behind number one and what that meant to you. And then you can talk a little bit about the ones that are coming afterward. Yeah. Um, well, we ended up going to this Gestapo prison at Terezin in the Czech Republic because Bob and I had decided to go to Prague one year, which is a beautiful city we loved. Um, but that has been was an integral part of World War II also. 
So we just took a regular bus up. It's about 30 minutes, 30 miles away from Prague. So we took a bus there. We weren't on a tour or anything. We like to do things on our own. And we entered the, um, the prison camp. It was first built as a fortress, by the way. And a lot of buildings have skylights in them, including some of those which were cells for horrible things happening to these people who were arrested. And, you know, through no fault of their own. It's just that, you know, they, they were the people who were arrested were, um, for instance, um, uh, Germans who were escaping the Nazis, uh, the gypsies, intellectuals, Jews. There was a wide variety of people who were um, arrested and put in this, in this camp, which was really an intermediate camp. Most of them went on to concentration camps where they died. Uh, some of them were in regular prisons uh, instead. Uh, there was a variety of people there. But when I, uh, the first one I painted was, and I decided to name Echoes of Their Voices because I felt that so clearly when I was painting that. When I saw this room, it was one of the rooms that was called a mass cell where it held 600 people at a time not not in a you know I mean it's like they'd have to be stacked like cordwood we were in that room and that room is in the uh, a book that I got when we were there on terracine on the camp and explaining it all and what happened there it's really horrible it's hard to imagine there were 600 people crammed in this room of course much of the time it was cold a lot of people were sick from you know numerous just ailments and lice and and very sick um but um I, I, if I if I could say something about some you know what you use in a lot of your work not just this particular okay. series but your use of light and dark and reflection and shadowing I think particularly really resonates with this series and when I Thank looked you. at this echoes of their voices mm -hmm. for the first time what I got it from was I didn't I didn't know about the 600 people at this point mm -hmm. but I was just picturing any people that were in this room it's mm -hmm. very haunting yet you have this light that's above and I was thinking the light expresses maybe here's the outside world here's freedom here's something better light right yet there are those there's those heavy beams that mm -hmm. are lower in the painting coming yeah, down yeah. towards the mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. so it's almost like they're being taunted like there's freedom but you're not going to get it mm -hmm. that's like honestly what I when I first saw it this all sort of flashed through me so um and that's one wonderful. of the reasons why I think the first couple of these paintings I've seen of yours from this series yeah. are so powerful it is the, the haunting that that comes out from your work because of your use of light and dark, I think. So, um, thank you. I think this one really... first because you thought maybe this one just projected the whole idea of this fact of being trapped. I did. And I, I think, uh, I think of it as the centerpiece. At first I was sort of thinking as the frontispiece, I was sort of trying to uh, arrange the paintings. I will, at least when I have them all shown together in a chronological order, or not necessarily chronological order, but, in the, the manner at which we went through the camp and the, the, okay. the rooms that we saw first. But the reason that the light comes from above in that mass cells, as horrible as it was, and of course you could see all these dark corners in it, but the light to me also represents spirituality um, that they're hopefully, you know, in another life that they will have, you know, redemption from these horrible things that they went through. And, uh, you know, what what hope could you have while you're in that situation and crammed in with all these people who are all sick and, and barely fed at all and, uh, you know, with very little access to any kind of, you know, even to water and to clean up. It was just a horrible situation. So when truly, I heard, it, it truly becomes almost like a tangible light out of darkness, right? And yes. we've heard in history, we've heard about some of these people who uh, hid the Jews and um, tried to, to help people and put their when own the lives were. on the line. And and yeah. the, some of those stories, you know, or in Anne Frank's diary, even how yes. she was able to we've keep been there her too. heart. Yeah. And yeah. all of that, they will sort of represent the light that came from this darkness too, right? Yes. I, I mean, I think that history, I, I was going to ask you a little bit about history. Um, this is an historical series because you're, you're showing yes. people what happened in the past. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you think that um, 
fine art in any way, your art in particular, helps people to become more interested in history instead of just, for instance, reading about th these things that have happened in the past through a textbook? I, I hope so, yes, particularly, of course, in this series, because it's such, it is an important part of history. And people are, you know, there are very few of those people left who, left who experienced it. And, and a lot of people just aren't going to know that much. And I, I think it's important, maybe it will inspire someone to you know, to want to read about it, to learn more about it. But when I first started painting on, and that was the first one I wanted to do, I think to just kind of set myself, you know, and that, that's a larger painting. It's, um, it's not, might be six feet wide or five feet wide, but anyway, it's, um, when I start, when I started painting though, I was actually crying when I was painting because I felt so guilty um, that I'm getting to paint this, but people just suffered so much there. But then I, I, kind of forgave myself because because I thought, no, the thing is I want to honor them. Yes. I want them to know that we care. We care what happened to them. We don't want that ever to happen again. Although, of course, there are always atrocities in the world, unfortunately. But God, I, I just pray that we can have um, a better better humanity in the world. Yeah. And, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, you know, do you think that... I know that these pieces for me definitely provoked an actual visceral response, but right. if you're thinking about the viewer having a visceral response, do you think in any way if people are really moved by pieces of fine art that they see that they can navigate their present and their future a little differently after being exposed to these different pieces of artwork? I, I really do. Um, it, it's funny, I've had some experiences with this because not well, I haven't shown this this as a whole yet. The only one I've shown publicly is the one, I guess the one that you saw at the Albany Institute. Did you go? Ethnic that where... cleansing. Ethnic cleansing, yes. I saw oh, that. At, oh, okay. I saw ethnic cleansing was at one art space in it was Tribeca. In New York. At the 131st, I think, now yeah. uh, exhibition. So that, that, that was actually the painting that I saw when we first entered the Gestapo prison there. Um, we had been to a few more rooms just that were part of the uh, administrative, you know, offices, but, but the one that I saw, and I was snapping pictures, we were allowed to do that. I had a, a book with us, a map that is, that told us what room was what and what happened there. And the one that really hit me in the first place was what I did, the painting Ethnic Cleansing that you saw in New York from, because it was, you know, you go through this, this ante room that had these uh, peeling filling paint on the walls. And then through that little niche, you could see this wooden tub with these mysterious uh, two shower heads hanging over it. And I'm, I'm really not sure, but when I was reading more about Terezin recently, they were talking about they had some delousing stations and maybe that's what that was for because I saw other rooms that had a lot of shower heads over it where people just took group showers and this wasn't where they gassed them, but it was kind of like that. So I'm not sure what that room, what that tub was used for because it didn't seem to make sense. Um, okay. So maybe it was a delousing station, I'm not sure, but it's when I snapped that picture because I was taking pictures all along. And, and still kind of feeling guilty that I'm even taking pictures, but I wanted, I wanted to remember this, to know this. And I just think even just as for myself, I think it's important for me to know about it, be aware of terrible things. And I want to be able to let other people know. So when I saw that, when I snapped the picture and I could see it on my digital camera, I showed it to Bob and I said, I have to paint this. And, and not only do I have to paint this, I knew already before even seeing the rest of the camp that, I have to tell their story. That there was a lot there. I have to let them know they're not forgotten. So you're working currently on Sick Room, which is the fourth, I believe, in the series, yes, right? Yes. Um, this one is more lit, I want to say, where it kind of just, it promotes that idea, I think, of a, like a medicinal sort of space mm -hmm. <clears throat> with very like stark hard like surfaces do you mm -hmm. want to say something a little bit about that one since that's the current one that you're you're finishing up yeah. at this point yeah that was a room that there were for some really sick obviously there were many sick people who didn't get any treatment at all but I don't know how they were chosen but there was this room that we went in that was called um I think it was called sick room that was actually the name of it 
where some of the inmates who were doctors took care of the other inmates who were sick. Okay. And those pieces of equipment that are in the room are just as barren as they are, as pitifully ineffective as they might be, are, are still there. And they were just there at random. And I just painted them the way that I saw them in the spaces that they were in. It was, it was a white room. This brilliant white light was coming in the sh the, from, from that window. And um, it, it, I just painted it as I, as I saw it, only intensifying the light more. You know, it's essentially a black and white painting or a white painting, but I used some black to, you know, for shading. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a, a powerful image of uh, what went on there. I see this series for you, Penny, once it's complete, it being shown in its entirety. You know, right. just like it, almost like an experience. So, so that yeah, people, yeah. they yes. weren't there with you, but yes. they're experiencing it with you through your work. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I know that I definitely can't wait to see what happens with this series. And I know some of the listeners who are listening now will want to know that. Do you have anything um, planned for this year? I know you're only about a third of the way through, <laughs> but is there anything planned for any of these pieces that are already done or that you're going to be doing in the future, either through a virtual exhibition or perhaps an in-person one? I'm, I'm hoping for the best with the vaccine being out, but you know, we're still dealing with this pandemic right now. So I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that at all or how people can reach you and find out more about what yes. you're doing too. Yes. Well, I do want to, I do want to show all these at a piece, whether it's, you know, I hope it's 12 paintings. Um, I just now showed one and the, the, jo the show just ended at Albany Institute of History and Art. One of the, the second piece, which was called Admissions Stripped Bear, it was where literally they brought in the, the people who had been arrested. They, with the men, they took all their clothes from them and no, usually gave them uh, some tattered uniform that had belonged to another conquered army, you know, from some other country. And they had minimal, very minimal things. And so now the, that room, which you haven't seen yet um, in person at least, also had, a, it's, it's a dark room, but it had brilliant light coming through these two windows and reflecting on the surface of, there were only two pieces of furniture left in that room. One was a desk where, you know, they would be writing in, you know, this is this prisoner entered here and then there was a very small bookcase um in the room too so that's what that one was about and um, that's here i love your title for that stripped bear because it was. and then the the people were stripped bare the room is stripped bare they're stripped of their dignity yes um, you know it, it's it's barren with this bright light and dark you know the the bright light in the darkness. Uh, there's another one. I, I can't name all of them that I that I plan on painting. But for instance, there's one across from where the mast cell is in a particular part of the complex. Across the so-called yard from that, there is another another several room or several parts of the building that are for solitary cells. And in one of them that I took a picture of, um, there's a narrow hallway down the middle. There's the skylight on top, but along the sides of, of the hallway, there are all these doors, which they have opened now to just to indicate that there are these cells in there, but they're very small cells, no light. No, you know, the doors were normally closed. There's a little square, maybe about six inches square, maybe nine inches square window at the top of each door with some screen on it. And okay. that's very moving. Another, another uh, room in particular that I wanna do maybe three paintings of the same thing from different angles. It's a very small room. I can say this without crying. Um, it's where they stacked the bodies. People who died and then they couldn't, they didn't bury them right then. What they did was they stacked these stiff bodies in this room. That's, that's another one of the paintings I plan to do. There are some other cells that weren't the mass ones like that one of Echoes of Their Voices, but uh, that had just several bunks in it and a small stove. And, you know, I, there are some just interesting images to me and I think that helped tell their story. 
So it does. And you know, the light, I know we've been talking a lot about, you know, how a lot of the pieces are dark or shadowed in sections. And then you have this bright light that comes through. And I'm almost thinking that, that this could also mean we see you like now today in the present, yeah. we see what's happened to you. And we're yes. shining like literally a light on it, right? Yes, your work. yes. It's yeah. really such an important series, Penny. I'm so mm -hmm. happy you're doing this because your work, all of your work is phenomenal. But this series just is going to speak to a lot of people, I think. And um, I hope so. That's why I, I hope, I'd really like to have them shown together. I would, I'm not far enough along right now. Um, and as you know, <laughs> the reason I'm not as far along as I'd like to be right now yes. is I broke my wrist and my elbow uh, about more than five months ago. And it's taken a long time. So it, it and I'm not supposed to be painting according to my surgeon. <laughs> so, okay. So you have to put a little bit of a pause, but it's all up here, right? What you want to do? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I, I just have, you know, I believe everything happens as it should. And I think ultimately, like times that I have not been able to paint for whatever reason, it's frustrating to me. But on the other hand, you know, and I'm afraid like, but, you know, I had such a momentum going on that. But when you get back to it, you find you don't lose anything that actually something's been gelling inside that comes out that actually enhances it. So yes. I'm not going to complain. You know, I think it's all for the best. I have great faith that, you know, I'll be able to finish the series. I want them shown as a whole, even though I've shown one. Well, I've shown two. It, I know, would and, love to see them shown as a whole. I know the listeners who have heard happen. you today want to see that too. So will you have at pennybrantley.com, will you have, um, you yes. know, information about that as the series moves along? So if people want to follow this, they can go there. I, I will. Yeah, I don't at the moment. I, I think I might have put one or two of the photos on my website right now. I'm not sure. But there are a couple of uh, Jewish museums in particular. Not that it was only Jews, by the way, who were killed, of course. Right. During, so all during different the, people. I know. Uh, yeah. I, I would hope that maybe they would be interested. Um, I know there's one in Philadelphia. Of course, there's one in New York. Um and there are some good places that it's too soon for me to say I haven't, I, I felt I'm not ready to approach them yet. Maybe when I get this fourth one finished, I'll feel like I can start now because of course you have to book things in advance, but I have had uh, good things going on with, uh, well, some virtual shows, of course, while, while the, uh, while COVID was happening, but is happening, but um also, I got uh, virtually, I got a couple of nice awards, like uh, from National Association of Women Artists. I, I got a Medal of Honor for painting. Mm -hmm. And also, to my huge surprise, uh, my wonderful, uh, wonderful people in my hometown, a tiny little mid-southern town, contacted me recently that, unbeknownst to me, it was a total shock, that they had approached, um, they had submitted me to, and, and found a lot of info about my work, to submit to, do you know what DAR is? Daughters of the American Revolution. Yes. Well, they have a branch called the American Heritage uh, Women in the Arts um, Recognition Award. And they gave it to me. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is, that's truly deserved, Penny. And I know I wish we could have more time, but I'm going to have to close out today. But I'm hoping that you will keep sanctuary abreast of what's happening with this series, because uh, it just, it's going to oh, speak to you. a lot of people. I think it shines a lot, a light on something that happened that we need to continue to talk about. We want to prevent these things from happening in the future. It's such you an just, important series. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank it's you truly so much. a pleasure to have you oh, on today. It's great that. to see you. You're always too kind to me, and I just treasure everything that you do. You are just a marvel. And I told you the first time I met you, the, the best word I could think of for you is dynamo. Oh, now, <laughs> thank you, I told Bob that. Bob said, when we mentioned you the other day, he said, she's a dynamo. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for all you do and for just your work is so beautiful. And I wish you oh, all the you. best this year in 2021. I know we'll be in touch. It's going to be great. But, yeah. <laughs> but I want to close by saying, as I always do, that I wish all of our listeners and our readers good health, happiness, and continued inspiration until the next time.